and minds to receive you afresh. Father, we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I am so happy that once again you chose to join us in our Bible study. We continue on article number 11, The Perseverance of Saints. And our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure unto the end that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And so once again, we are going to jump back on to the scenic route. Uh, even though I normally read from the uh, New International Version. This time, I'll read from the King James Version. And I'll be reading John, third chapter, verse 16. And it reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whenever uh, my family get together, one of the things that we do is to find a good movie to watch. And, and there, are all, there are times when they might start the movie and I'm busy doing this or that. And as a result, I come in the middle of the picture. And now, of course, my MO is to start asking all kinds of questions. Yeah, I'm that person. It, it drives my younger son especially. It just drives him crazy. He will pause the movie and, and more times than not suggest that I watch the whole movie at another time and to just let them watch this one in peace. John 3.16 is a powerful verse all by itself. And most times, that's how we read it or that's how we memorize it. But since I've been or since we've been on this scenic route, seeing that verse in the context it was written has been a blessing for me. In times past, when I heard it or uh, read it or said it or I never thought about it being in the middle of a conversation. A conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. John 3 and 16 is probably the clearest demonstration of the gospel. It, it's an excerpt of a conversation between Jesus and a Pharisee named Nicodemus. To always start there, it's like jumping in the middle of the movie. Nicodemus, having uh, heard or seen the miracles that Jesus performed and having heard or heard about the teachings or the many truths of Jesus, Nicodemus came to Jesus with this nagging question, who are you? I've tried through uh, the help of the Holy Spirit to peek into the mind of Nicodemus. And we started, remember, we started at the beginning of the conversation. And so we wanted to get a glimpse of how Perplex, perplexing this conversation with Jesus had to have been for Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus was used to relating to God through religious works. He, 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 um, 
he walked a certain way, he wore a certain religious attire, and said a lot of religious cliches. In, in other words, he performed religiously. He, he was used to dealing with people by displaying a pious attitude that screamed, you are not good enough. I'm okay, but you will never be okay. And, and so instead of confirming Nicodemus' self-righteousness, Jesus, in a way that only Jesus could do, tells Nicodemus that all of his years of climbing the ladder in Judaism, all the time he spent reciting prayers and participating in religious festivals, amounted to nothing. All of that stuff could not save him. He, in other words, he had been making noise and saying nothing. Can you imagine how Nicodemus felt? He had been stripped of everything he knew. So often in life, when the rug is pulled out from under us, or, or when everything we thought we knew turns out to be false, so often in life when that happens, we're left with a feeling of emptiness, not knowing what to do or how to move forward. The wonderful thing about Jesus is that he never takes without giving us better. He won't leave us in a brokenness, in, in our brokenness. Uh, the lyrics of a Shirley Caesar song, it says, Jesus, he's the only one that can help us. If you go to him and be sincere, his blood will restore your soul. Let's put last week's verse together with this week's verse and, and read it again. We're not starting at the beginning, but we're putting a little bit more to the verse to, to read it, verses 14 through 16 together. It, it says, and, and this is the King James Version, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believe, believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The lesson of the fiery serpent is the resemblance to the cross or the crucifixion of Jesus. When the people were bitten by the serpents, Moses made what resembled a serpent and hung it on a pole. The people looked to it in faith and they received healing. And through that healing, they also received life. Yeah, that's the gospel. When the, when the world was perishing because of a deadly poison called sin, Jesus, made to resemble sin, was hung on the cross that whosoever looked unto him in faith received not only healing, but also life, eternal life, everlasting life. We are no longer condemned for not obeying the law. Throughout the history of Israel, after leaving Egypt, it, it was a constant cycle. The people would sin, God's judgment would come, Moses or the prophets or the judges would intercede on their behalf and God would be merciful. By the time Jesus came, Things had not changed much. They, they were still rebelling against God. 
But this time, God would send his son, his only son. So unlike the serpent on the pole, which was a temporary fix, this time, the remedy would be everlasting. Sadly, the bronze serpent eventually became an idol that was worshipped. And during the reign of Hezekiah in, in 2 Kings uh, 18 and 14, it, it was one of the many idols that Hezekiah destroyed. Jesus would be the one whom the Lord would lift up. And through him, mercy and salvation would come. A saving faith looks to Jesus to be the mediator. A mediator is a, a, a sort of a go-between that works between two parties that have disagreements. Jesus stands between God and us, the people. He stands in the gap. We were God's enemies without hope. The New Living Translation of Romans 5 says, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for our sinners. If, if you have ever been in a situation where you just could not help yourself, and in spite of your pride, you had to allow somebody to help you. I, I think most of us that it, it is on, most of us that is one of the downside, for most of us that is one of the downsides of getting old. The possibility of not being able to help yourself. That's a scary place to be. Where you have to depend on somebody else to take care of you. None of us wants to be in that place, but sometimes in spite of us, we're there. Have you ever been in a situation like I was uh, back in early 80s? I, I was south of Tunica with two small kids in the car and without warning, something falls from under the hood and within minutes the car is inoperable remember now this is in the 80s south of tunica and, and cell phones had not been invented we used back then we used phone booths and they were not out in the middle of nowhere there weren't even any houses the only thing was just land as far as the eye could see. And, and now, and every now and then, a vehicle came by, but it didn't stop. I'm on the side of the road, and nobody stopped. And, and did I mention, it is late July, early August, which means it is hot, scorching hot. But God, there was a guy on a tractor out in the field. He was so far that from where I was, he looked like a speck. That is utterly helpless. But God, you ever been so utterly helpless that you didn't even think prayer could help? One of my sons, who was uh, about five years old at the time, kept saying, Mommy, we need to pray, which really just frustrated me more than it calmed me down. So to shut him up, we held hands and prayed. Y'all, when I opened my eyes, I looked out in that same field again, and that tractor that was just a speck before is now somewhat recognizable and it's coming toward us that tractor kept coming 
until he got to us. The man stopped, came out to the car, came over to the car, and asked if we needed help. While he was talking, a guy in a truck was passing by on the highway, recognized the guy on the tractor, and pulled over and stopped. They both looked at the car and decided that we needed, it, it needed to be towed. So the guy in the truck who was on his way going through Tunica uh, said that he would stop and send a tow, tow truck back for us. This is God. The tow truck comes and tows us to the service station in Tunica. Did I mention I had no money and credit cards weren't a thing back then? You either had, you know, we were in the 80s. In the 80s, you either had cash or check, to which I had neither. We're talking utterly helpless. But God, the guy in the service station gives us a soda and lets me make a phone call, which was long distance at that time, and it wasn't free. Remember y'all, we are in Tunica, Mississippi in the 1980s. That was not the norm. But God, the New Living Translation of Romans 5 and 6 says, when we were utterly helpless, that's helpless. Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. The songwriter puts it like this. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply staying within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters he lifted me now safe am i god lifted me god through jesus christ lifted us while we were utterly helpless god sent his son to die for us that we could be lifted up. And with that, I'm finished for today. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. Please come back again next time as we continue on the scenic route. For now, bye-bye and see you next week.